heaven I'm in heaven And my heart beats so that I can hardly speak And I seem to find the happiness I see When we're out together dancing cheek to cheek When you hear Fred Astaire sing this song from Top Hat, you think Americana, a romantic optimism that movie musicals can do so well. But it's a shriveled genre over a decade since the last critically acclaimed, financially successful American musical. Rob Marshall's Chicago won Best Picture. Picture, it's been pretty slow since. Although the biggest movie of the year is the animated musical Frozen. With us to talk about the evolution of the Hollywood musical is film historian Richard Barry author of Dangerous Rhythm, Why Movie Musicals Matter. Welcome. Thank you, and what a wonderful treat to be introduced in by Mr. Astaire. Isn't it? You can't beat that for an introduction. Let's talk about that, because to me, Top Hat is just a wonderful example of mid-1930s movie musical. And you know, speak a little bit to the performances in that film and its impact. Well, for one thing, it is so central to the whole concept of uh, musical cinema that my publisher elected to put uh, Still from Top Hat on the cover of the book. And actually, the uh, the title of the book, Dangerous Rhythm, also comes from another Astaire song, The Continental. So he's really um, central to the whole concept. And, of course, when these films were made in the mid-1930s, it was the golden age, what's so-called, of the studio system and musical film was regarded at that time as a central part of the product that these uh, companies were making and after the 1960s um, it sort of all fell apart just as the studio system did and musicals didn't really survive the decline of the studio system at that time. And I mentioned Frozen, the enormous success that that animated musical had. But, of course, animated musicals go way back. Let's listen to this from 1937's classic Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Richard Barrios, how, how much of the animated, you know, musicals, whether they were shorts or long-form films like this, had an influence on live-action movie musicals? Well, from the very beginning, I believe, the animated shorts, and then, of course, this was the first animated feature uh, with, with music in it. Uh, they sort of all have always borrowed from each other, and the interesting thing was that much, much later the only good uh, feature films, musicals being made, were animated, like the South Park film and some of the Disney. And as you said earlier, Frozen has become this mega hit worldwide, and it fun- functions very directly as, um, as a successor to Snow White, telling, telling the story partly through the music with characters the audience cares about and with kind of fantasy, goofy supporting characters. So the the historical tradition always continues. And that's one of the central premises of the book is that the, the, the movies that really matter for being musicals are the ones that understand their history and the historical continuity. Uh, the ones that claim to be doing something new are either lying to themselves or they're <laughs> lying to us. That's, that's funny. Well said. I, the other thing that's interesting to me about animated versus live action is that live action musicals typically dance is central to it. And I think that's really a lost art form, being able to photograph dance well on screen. And with animated ones, because the movement of the characters, I mean, it's interesting, but it's not the same sort of spectacle that seeing a real human being doing those moves gives. And, and so, to me, the loss of the live-action movie musical it is still big because you're not getting that kind of human movement on screen. 
Well, every once in a while they try uh, in live musicals for that. Uh, Chicago, which I uh, I like very much, did get a good deal of criticism, especially from dance critics, that Rob Marshall photographed the dances in too choppy and hyper-edited yeah. a form. And, of course, some of the really good animated films have had direct homages to live-action musical sequences like Disney's Beauty and the Beast, which stopped in the middle of it for this big Busby Berkeley-style production number, which which worked beautifully. Um, I think also is that a lot of more recent musicals, it's easier for them to segue from the script into singing than it is dancing. That takes a little more of a stretch, you know, and, a little more suspension of disbelief. And for some reason, and I think this is true even of Rob Marshall with the success he's had in the musical genre, they, they don't want to show the full body of the dancer because it seems like the editing is more the star. So they do all the, the quick cuts, and you're only getting parts of the body in close-up. You're not getting the full human form. And for dance to really be effective, for me as a viewer, I need to see it in a much larger scale. I need to see the whole of the human body. When I look at the classic musicals and you see multiple people dancing together on screen, it's just much more emotionally powerful than what even what was done in Chicago with dancing. Absolutely. And that, unfortunately, uh, that whole chopped up fragmentary uh, system is sort of one of the uh, prices we're paying for MTV coming along in the 80s. Uh, that really influenced how dance was going to be photographed, whereas someone like Astaire would have it uh, mandated in his contracts even that he be photographed full figure with a minimum number of edits. So you see a number like Cheek to Cheek or Never Gonna Dance, these these wonderful uh, narratives in in, in dance, and... it's you. It's not a matter of close-ups of feet or faces or hands or anything else. It's the it's the whole figure because that's how a genius like Astaire was best able to communicate. We're talking with film historian Richard Barrios, author of Dangerous Rhythm: Why Movie Musicals Matter. He was describing the uh, cover jacket of the book, and it's wonderful. A huge top hat and dancing right alongside it. Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers. Uh, the movie is a look back, a very personal one by Richard. Barrios at the power of music, uh, movie musicals and the ideas that they convey. And of course, they're very different ideas decade to decade. I, I'd love to hear your contribution to this conversation by joining us at 866 893 5722, 866 893 KPCC, or you can post on the air talk page kpcc.org. Your favorite musical scene from a film if you have have one particular whether it's a song or whether it is a a choreographed dance scene of a film what is for you the most powerful uh, of any movie that you've seen 866-893-5722 is there one Richard that for you just knocks it out more than any other uh yeah (laughs) it's not really any kind of a secret Uh, that my favorite film is The Wizard of Oz. And if your favorite film is going to be The Wizard of Oz, chances are your favorite song is going to be Over the Rainbow. And the the very simple, direct way that song is shot, I think, is, is, is marvelous. And it sets a tone for the whole movie. And as I wrote in the book, at one point before the, the film was in its final form, uh, MGM was considering cutting over the rainbow out of the Wizard of Oz. Just imagine. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's just uh, it's just amazing to think of that of that possibility. As movie musicals evolved, it seemed like they became more and more bloated, particularly by the late fifties into the nineteen sixties. And is this a response to television? It's partly a response to television, and partly. Um, a, a, a firmer I- idea, notion that Broadway had the the correct model. So try to make the movies more like Broadway. So that's when the the it was the the road show picture, where which didn't run in continuous showings as most movies did and do. Uh, there were two a day, and you had reserved seats, and you actually had to dress up to go. To the, to the movies. And, you know, I remember as a kid having to wear a tie to see The Sound of Music 
Yeah. So <laughs> it, it was the notion that My Fair Lady on Broadway had to be the same kind of event on film. And it took a lot of the energy and spontaneity, and some of these movies got to be uh, too reverential and way too overstuffed. And then, you know, as this kept going along and times were changing, the Vietnam War and civil rights and all all these things, you know, this is when uh, musicals ceased to matter because they were losing touch with their audiences and with their times. Let's listen to uh, 1958's Gigi, which was an Oscar winner for Best Film and Maurice Chevalier. How lovely to sit here in the shade With none of the woes of man and maid I'm glad I'm not young anymore The rivals that don't exist at all The feeling you're only two feet tall I'm glad that I'm not young so is this one of those musicals that fits that Broadway to the screen formula you were talking about? Well, it sort of outdoes Broadway in a way. Uh, it's Gigi is regarded often not totally accurately as the last great original Hollywood musical, but it was conceived and put together basically uh, as a filmic equivalent of my Fair Lady, because it had the same people working on it, the songwriters and Lerner and Lowe and the designer, Cecil Beaton. But if you look at the film of Gigi side by side with the film of My Fair Lady, I think it's pretty clear which one works better as a film. And that's not to take away from My Fair Lady on the stage, mm -hmm. but Gigi really is a film where My Fair Lady sort of typifies this overstuffed kind of reverential rut that big musicals got into in the 1960s and that eventually, you know, after some real dogs around 1970 or so, uh, really kind of killed them off. Addison in North Hollywood offers one of my favorite scenes. It's the Nicholas Brothers, the famous dancing on the stairs in stormy weather. Just uh, anything I've ever seen them do was remarkable. But that, was a, that was a great scene. That's dazzling, and they save it for near the end of the movie, Stormy Weather, and what else could top it? Maybe not even Lena Horne singing the title song, which is another great moment. Stormy Weather is one of two movies in the mid-1940s that I write about in the book that have all black casts, and it gives the opportunities to a number of performers that you wouldn't have seen as much of in film at that time otherwise and we are so blessed that these movies were made and the script of Stormy Weather isn't great but with all those mm -hmm. people Lena Horne and Bill Robinson and the Nicholas Brothers Cab Calloway uh, it, it shows how good sections of musical entertainment can be on, on film Gary in Santa Monica you're on Air Talk Last night I watched Up in Arms with Dinah Shore and Danny Kaye and there's this tremendous dance and song number near the end of the movie. It's one of my favorites, and I was just happy to catch it on TV last night. Yeah, and do you know the song they're uh, performing? Oh, gosh. It was it was kind of a mix of a boogie-woogie and, and using all kinds of ter jazz terms, give me some skin and groovy, and uh, rapid-fire vocals like Danny Kay does. And, of course, uh, the, the whole body dancing that you were talking about, yeah. where you see all the dancers uh, behind them and all the dance moves that they were doing. Very good. I appreciate the recommendation, Gary. Up in arms from 1944. Richard? Yes. Uh, Danny Kaye is a sort of underrated figure in musicals, and people forget. They, they remember his comedy and maybe some of the tongue-twisting songs, but they forget what a good dancer he was. And Up in Arms was his sort of star debut, and Sam Goldwyn had to uh, work hard to present him as, as uh, a figure that all of America would like. So I think he had a nose job and they dyed his hair blonde and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But it, it, it established him as a star and as a really outstanding musical performer. Um, a film like Hans Christian Andersen may not be very good from a biographical standpoint, <laughs> but as far as Kay performing and some really, really good songs. Yeah, by the Frank songs Lesser, are terrific, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Pasadena Ed is one of my favorite. Donald O'Connor from Singing in the Rain, Make Him Laugh, which 
absolutely stands out. And I think for, for many of us, we consider the greatest uh, of all musicals a terrific film. And I agree. Uh, it is so perfect, and one of the reasons it, it does have this sort of pantheon uh, connotation to it is because it does understand what movie musicals are. It draws from the history, and it kids the history, but it understands, and it understands its place in that whole progression. And that's what I was saying earlier. The ones who really get the whole idea of this march of history where musicals are concerned are the ones that really work, and the ones that don't are, are clueless. Uh, Mark in West Adams says, you know, do you think old school musicals are a viable option or it's all going the Boz Lerman kind of approach? Because it seems like actors just can't dance mm. anymore. Um, well, Catherine Zeta-Jones did very well. Yeah, I thought she was didn't terrific. Know. She had been in musical theater before. And, yeah. Um, Richard Gere did all right, but again, it's something you were talking about earlier. His dance was so frag- fragmented the way it was photographed. Some people thought it wasn't him, yeah. and, and it was, but, but, but it didn't seem that way. I think that there are probably some really good people who could do it. Um, but a, for a lot of musical film production, the uh, the economics are against it. Yeah. You know, th- they're they're so expensive, or they they can be so expensive, and they're not going to do the grosses of a Spider Man or yeah. something. And the whole concept of production numbers, these you know big numbers like the caller was talking about earlier with Danny Kaye, has so, the whole what, what used to be that kind of escapism mm-hmm. now is big CGI number. A you know, whole, Godzilla whole different is kind of thing. Today. Richard, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. Dangerous Rhythm is book, you. Why Movie Musicals Matter. Richard Barrios with us on Air Talk. Diana Valley Village says, West Side Story, the dancing and chorus portions are amazing. Sean says, the Muppets were a, tr- a tremendous bridge between the older and newer musicals. And Gloria and Arcadia loves Barbara Streisand in Funny Lady. Remind you, film-oriented auction items, kpcc.org slash auction. Have a great weekend.